I was born deaf. All I had ever known was deafness. One of my first memories as a child was being put in a stroller by my mother to go to the town park. A train passed through downtown and I could feel the rumble and vibrations in my body and see the lights but I didn't understand why my mother put her hands over her ears and cringed. As I grew older I learned to read lips and find other ways to overcome my disability but my lifelong dream was to find a way to hear, feeling vibrations and reading lips until I died was a poor substitute. A couple years ago, I was contacted by an experimental research facility. They stated they had returned hearing in animal subjects, then asked if I would be interested in being among the first human subjects to receive this treatment. I emailed them back immediately and before I knew it, I was being flown across the country. Now, Tristan, in the interest of full disclosure, the lead scientist, Dr. Klein, told me some of the animal subjects have had rather bizarre reactions. Like you, they were born deaf. We think that the sudden shock of being able to hear again may have been the cause. This didn't cause me much distress. I was too excited about the prospect of being able to hear. What do you mean by bizarre reactions? I signed. He watched my movements. Having worked with the deaf so long, he knew sign language, but not very well. Well, some had irritability and aggressiveness, he said. A few even tried to attack the scientists or other animals, even though they had previously been docile. That's really about it. He shrugged. It didn't sound too bad to me. I nodded, signing the documents needed to get started. Before I knew it, I was wheeled into the surgical wing and being given an IV solution of anesthetic drugs, counting backwards as they flowed into my veins. Within seconds, everything went black. I awoke screaming and in pain. My head felt like it was bursting. Oh God, oh God, it hurts. I thought to myself in sign language. Then, with mounting confusion, I realized I could hear my own screams. Nurses came rushing into the room, saying something that I didn't catch. The amount of overload was too much for my brain to handle, especially combined with the post-operative pain. I looked over at the nearest one, trying to read her lips. Give him more fentanyl, she said to a tall, male nurse. He ran out of the room, going to get the opioids while she tried to calm me down. She put a hand on my shoulder. It's okay, she said. The surgery went well. He might have a lot of pain in the immediate aftermath of it, but it will quickly fade. I was still reading lips, even though I could hear the words. I would have to retrain my brain to use the sounds rather than the movement of lips to understand people. More difficult than that, I would have to learn to speak on my own. Being born totally deaf, I had never been able to make sounds that people could understand as words, even though I had tried in the past. That was all about to change. I raised my trembling hands and touched the sides of my head. Lines of stitches ran behind my ears where they had cut me open and sawed through the bone. The tall nurse ran back in with a glass vial. He took a syringe, measuring out a dose of fentanyl, and then injected it into the main intravenous line running into my body. The relief was immediate. The pain mostly dissipated within seconds. I laid back down, sighing in pleasure. It was like a tropical breeze was blowing across my body while the opioids kicked in. With my head on the pillow, I calmed myself down and listened. I heard those in the room with me the nurses talking and the beeping of machinery, but I also heard strange sounds that didn't come from the room. I heard screaming, singing, moans of horror and sighs of pleasure. I didn't know it at the time but I was hearing my first otherworldly sounds. Over the next few weeks, I quickly learned how to speak as well as how to listen to words rather than just reading lips. There were no major complications from the surgery, but there were those sounds, the ones that didn't match anything going on in the room. I would hear them even in the middle of the night and sometimes even in my dreams. I could hear angels singing in heaven, men and women shrieking in hell. I could hear far stranger noises as well. Sometimes something slow and deep would pass into my hearing like a far off whale call. Other times, it would sound like teeth chattering. For a while, I thought I was going insane. I befriended the other subjects in the experiment. One of them, a woman named Eve, kept in contact with me after we had recovered and left. She called me one night at 11 p.m., panicking and crying. Tristan, she screamed, I can hear something coming up the stairs. So call 911. I said, why are you calling me? No, it isn't like that, she said. It isn't anything that the police could deal with. 
It is something, like what you told me you heard. I can hear its teeth chattering, and it's dragging something. I'm coming now, I said, running out to my car. You've only lived a few minutes away from my apartment. I sped 30 miles over the speed limit, pulling up in her driveway and jumping out of the car. Her door was wide open, and I could hear screaming from inside the house. I ran through and saw destruction everywhere. Her pictures and furniture had been smashed to bits. I went into her kitchen, grabbing the largest knife I could find, and followed the screams, afraid of what I would find up there. And yet, when I reached her bedroom, I found nothing. Her crying, panicked voice came from the closet. I opened it up and found her curled into a ball, hugging her knees as she rocked back and forth. Where is it? I hissed in a low voice. Where did it go? She shook her head, wiping her tears away. I don't know, she said, but it was talking to me. When it heard you coming, it left. It said it would be back. I gave her my hand, pulling her up and hugging her. You can spend the night at my place, I said. Tomorrow, we will go shopping for a gun. I made up the guest bed for Eve. She was still pale, her hands trembling. I gave her a bottle of water, and she dropped it on the floor, spilling it everywhere. She sat down on the bed and put her face in her hands. I sat down next to her and put my hand on her shoulder. I didn't know it then, but we would never get the chance to go find a gun. That night, we would both see something inhuman. I'm sorry, Eve said, looking over at me. But when I was at my place, I didn't just hear whatever that thing was with the chattering teeth. At first, it was alone. I could hear it coming up the stairs, and I could hear bumping as it dragged something heavy. As it got closer, I could hear its breath. It was a rattling, disgusting kind of noise, like it was trying to breathe through a thick layer of phlegm and blood. And then I heard my parents. Their parents, I said, surprised. She nodded, her eyes wide, moving her blonde hair out over her face. They had been dead for over three years, both of them. A terrible car accident. I wouldn't have even known their voices, but once they started talking, I knew. They were pleading with me to come out, saying, Oh, Eve. It hurts so bad. My bones are shattered. Please help us. We're not dead. We're still alive. And we feel everything. She started crying. I was thunderstruck. And yet, I also believed her. I put my arm around her, and she started kissing me. Her tears wet on her face, and her lips soft in the dark room, taking whatever she needed. We comforted each other then, with only the moonlight streaming through the window. And as I lay in bed next to her, falling asleep, I wondered if it would be for the last time in my life. I awoke suddenly to a thunk, thunk, thunk sound coming from downstairs. I sat straight up in bed. Eve still slept soundly next to me, naked except for a white sheet wrapped around the bottom half of her body. I wondered what to do. Maybe it's just a raccoon in the garbage. I thought to myself feebly, but I didn't really believe it. Then I heard the teeth start to chatter, and something started coming up the stairs. I shook Eve's shoulder. She murmured slightly. I shook her harder. You have to wake up, I said, whispering in her ear. Eve, something's here. I can hear it getting closer. Her blue eyes shot wide open as she understood my words, sitting straight up. She heard the thing coming up the stairs. I went to the closet. I might not have a gun, but at least I had some weapons. Nothing that I would want to use against a robber, perhaps, but I did collect odds and ends. In the closet, I kept a small collection of medieval swords and daggers, as well as a crossbow and an arrow gun. The arrow gun was able to use compressed carbon dioxide to shoot crossbow bolts at over 400 feet per second, and it was easier and faster than a crossbow to reload, though not nearly as fast as a gun. I cursed myself for not being armed. I never thought I would need a gun, and now, when I might die, I had to try to use weapons that were mostly just for personal entertainment and target shooting rather than actual home defense. I grabbed the arrow gun, turned on the laser sight, and pointed it at the door. I shoved an extra bolt into the corner of my mouth, seeing, as I was naked and had no pockets to put it in, the bolt jetted out of my mouth like a black, carbon fiber cigarette with a metal spike. The creature that approached us was, by this point, nearly at the door. I hissed over at Eve. Grab something from the closet, I said. She ran quietly behind me, looking at the closet to find a weapon. As the creature started to smash through the door, she grabbed an extremely sharp Tai Chi sword. The wooden door did not hold up very long. The first crash split the frame from the doorknob and threshold. After a couple more, it was ready to fall over. 
With a final ear splitting cacophony, the door exploded and pieces of wood went flying across the room. A couple small splinters hit me in the face and chest. I waited there. That old famous soldiering quote occurred to me, don't fire until you see the whites of their eyes. With hands that trembled and an iron will, I waited. The thing beyond the door took a step inside and I looked upon it with absolute horror. It stood before me with skin that was far too loose for its body like it had been drowned and its body had stayed in the water for days. Mottled, gray skin hung loose all over. I saw bugs feasting and squirming within some of the skin just a quick flash of a leech or a black beetle that stuck its head out and then ate or wriggled its way back in. Deeper into the body, the eyes were two different sizes. One was huge and bulging, streaked in burst blood vessels. The other was smaller, covered up with a fold of skin that gave it a winking, sly look. Neither had any white sclere, where it should have been white. It was a sickly, dark yellow, jaundiced color. The only thing on its swollen, drowned body that looked close to normal was its teeth. They were large, but otherwise, they were extremely straight and white. Like an actor's teeth, I thought to myself, but on this horrid apparition, they still looked out of place, and they chattered. They moved up and down constantly, as if this creature was freezing to death in front of us, but the mouth smiled as they did. I had no idea whether this was a man or a woman or whether it was even genetically human, though I thought probably no on all three. I waited, wondering what the creature wanted. I could hear it breathing, a choking, rasping sound that rattled its chest and throat. My finger was on the trigger and Eve held the sword out towards it and then it started to speak. My baby, my baby, it said in a voice like a middle-aged woman. Eve, why don't you come back home with us? Your father and I miss you so. And then suddenly, it had changed to a male's voice. That's right. It's been so long, Eve. We have been so cold and lonely. Death is a sad place to spend eternity. We just want to see you one more time. I was sick of this. I aimed the laser sight at its huge eye and it turned to me. Tristan, it cried in the voice of my mother who had died 10 years earlier of cancer. Oh my god, I can't believe it's you. Why did you never come visit me in the hospital, Tristan? All I wanted was to see you one last time. I felt like throwing up, my trembling, and fear getting worse, but I took breath in, steadied myself, and pulled the trigger. I watched its eye explode, thick jelly with squirming worms, and it began to drip down its cheek. A smell of putrescence and rotting fruit filled the room. I quickly reloaded the arrow gun, ignoring the horror in front of me. While I was looking at the front tube, sliding a bolt over it, the creature attacked. It ran at both of us. Seeing the movement out of the corner of my eye, I slid to the right, into the closet. Eve stood there, holding the sword up with both hands. The creature tried to dodge the blade, but she swung it back and forth when it was only a couple feet away, splitting open one of its bloated sides. Black, swamp-smelling fluid with leeches and squirming bugs flooded out of the wound. The creature wailed, a deafening and reptilian sound that made my ears ring. I shot the arrow gun at it again, but this time, it only glanced off its loose back skin. Swearing, I dropped the gun and grabbed a dagger. The creature had sunk its chattering teeth into Eve's shoulder by this point, drinking her blood. I could hear the revolting sucking sounds the entire time. I stabbed the dagger into the back of the creature. It took one long arm and smashed me into the back wall with incredible force. I slid down the wall and the dagger fell from my hand. I watched in horror as it opened its mouth and bit down on Eve's throat this time. She was looking at me as she screamed as her throat was ripped out and a waterfall of blood began to form down her chest. I picked up the dagger and ran, her dying face in my mind. I heard another sound from downstairs now, a new thump 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 and the sound of more chattering teeth and choking breaths. More of those creatures were coming. I locked myself in my room and sat on my bed, waiting to die, looking sadly at a picture of my mother I kept on the nightstand. Then an idea came to me. As they reached my door and began smashing it down, I took a thin letter opener from my desk and put it next to my left ear. With a sharp jab, I sent it into the side of my head. A fiery pain exploded in my ear but I heard the sound go out of it all the same. Now all I could hear from that ear was a high-pitched ringing. The door splintered apart. I saw four of those creatures now, all showing their huge smiles and eerily human teeth, all chattering in excitement. 
I took the letter opener and shoved it into my right ear. Blood was coming out of both sides of my head, staining the bed and the floor, and I was in excruciating pain. But as soon as my hearing was gone and only shrieking, high-pitched ringing remained. The creatures went away, flickering out of existence. That was the first and last time I ever tried to fix my deafness.